and we are back one year later. This is my most Christmassy jumper. So it is almost one year to the day since we painted this guy down here. He'll be appearing on screen now, better and larger. In this video, we're going to cover three do's and three do nots to help you get the best quality result you possibly can while slap chopping or texture based painting or speed painting, whatever you want to call it. Space Marines power armor. We're still doing red. We do like red, but we're going to be covering slap shop specifically for smaller sci fi things being Space Marines rather than larger fancy things being great big corn dragons. What should you do and what should you not do for slap chop? Hopefully, there are going to be some tips here that you don't know yourselves. You might know some of them. And of course, if you do want something to back it up, you can check out our, it's one of the most popular videos on the channel actually our slap shot video on the Bloodthirster. For those of you not wanting to miss a single thing, make sure you stick around until after our painting tips to see all of our information backed up by me painting this model. Let's jump in with quickly the stuff that no one wants to talk about. Assembly, I will keep it brief, I promise. Do not leave upward facing areas with rough, uh, you know, marks from your clippers or bad scraping or stuff like that on them because I did and I was punished. Not only that, but I was punished twice because I'd painted this mini before. I noticed some areas, for me it was around the legs and the top of the bicep area, you'd call it, that's holding the heavy gun up. It's upwards facing, it's so obvious that I should have smoothed it. Sanding sponge, 2000 grit, 3000 grit will be your friend. I'll pop a link for that below. I had an area upwards facing on my guy. You can't not see it if you're looking at the mini from the front. I could have just spent 10 seconds more scraping it and smoothing it and I didn't, and you can still see it now, and I wish it was smoother. Dry brushing is gonna pick out sharp edges or changes, especially if it's meant to be like a rounded area of armor or you know, like a leg or a helmet or something like that. And then you've got a flat section where you've clipped it off, or you've got a badly scraped section, or you've got a rough section. Dry brushing will pick that out, and then contrast will pull in rough areas in the recesses. It's quite unforgiving. So prep your areas properly, you will be rewarded. Okay, so our first do not. Do not expect contrast to do everything. Now this has multiple permutations, but um, one of them is if you can do something easier, better and faster with conventional brush paint, you know, like blocking it in and then putting a highlight on or not, you know, blocking it in, putting a wash down, something like that. You don't have to contrast everything. So a key example for this on my mini was the Aquila on his chest. It's quite awkwardly placed. There's gun in the way and trying to keep it light gray and white while I'm using a really strong red around it is just an utter waste of my time. So speaking from very personal experience, I should just try to avoid it still, but then gone in, blocked it in a gray or something like that, or whatever your base coat is, and then dry brushed it and then done it separately, which I could have contrasted or I could have painted normally. So don't spend ages trying to make your life harder, your mini look worse, and your mini take longer. Like, it sounds obvious, right? But it's really easy to just get into the contrasting zone, think this is easier, it's better. It's probably not dotting areas, dotting rivets, things like that. You're not gonna waste your time doing that, and the same goes for other things. Equally, if you wanna paint a, you know, a bald head for your guy, rather than a helmeted one, maybe contrast isn't the best way to do that either. So pick the right ways to do the right things for the job and you'll be rewarded. While we're at it, uh, there is no reason to not mix painting with your contrast to change the color if you want. There's no reason to not dilute it, the contrast medium if you want it softer or something like that. And you can use shades and contrast fairly interchangeably at this stage, I would say. There's some contrasts that are weaker than shades and behave like shades, and there's some shades that are stronger than those contrasts. So at this point, I think it's safe to say that whether something is called contrast or not doesn't particularly matter, particularly in GW's catalog when there's such a lot of confusion between them. One note as well, finally, on this subject, the heavy opaques are just quite hard to use. Those are the ones that look like inks, and the moment you touch something with them, they're really strong. They're kind of made for base coating. They are very difficult to get good effects out of. So for slap chop, maybe, rather than just, you know, spraying something white and putting them on it, I would probably avoid those ones. They're gonna give you more problems, and I would say they have benefits. Our second do, do think about brush size and shape. For this, I've used a lot of the new Series D Plus brushes. They are dry brushes that fall in the kind of smaller end of the spectrum. We've got quite a lot of variety there now. And these ones that I like to use for infantry. So particularly if you're stippling, which is poking rather than just kind of buffing or side to side brushing motion that people associate with dry brushing, it's really good to be able to get the right size for the job. For general dry brushing as well, if you can use the largest possible round brush for the job, well, that means you can go in circles and that'll just highlight things according to how much they stick out. And the bigger brushes, the more paint it can hold without being oversaturated, and also the more durable it is and the longer they'll last. So it'll help you achieve a high quality result. If you're using the dampening pad like we are to achieve high quality dry brushing as well, check out the video on this guy. 
It'll be um, linked at the end. I'll let you know the section of that that is particularly covering high quality dry brushing. If you are using the damping pads, try and keep things soft. If you're using the largest possible brush you can for the job that isn't too big, it's less uh, likely to get saturated with the moisture when you're doing that. So it's worth getting things right and using the right brush. This also goes for your contrast step. So for me, I settled on a size 2 uh, S, which is just a normal brush for this. Felt perfect, it's got a good point. It's got a decent belly, but not too big. If I was painting a monster or something, maybe I'd use a three or a four or a five. But on infantry, I want to be able to put down enough, but not too much contrast. And the way that I'm going to do that is I'm going to put it at the top of an area. I'll paint in sections. I'll put what looks like too much there, but then I'll drag that all down and put it all over the area in question until I stop getting enough paint on the areas that I need. Then I'll go back for more. So if you use a big brush, it's easier to oversaturate. And if you use one that's too small, it'll just take forever and you might actually encourage streaking. You don't want your contrast drying on the top of one section before you finish the bottom. You want them all to be wet so you can go back and fix them. Do not expect one thick coat to do all of your work for you. Flashback to our April Fool's video. So I know it's very, very tempting and it's how contrast are kind of designed, but especially on like smooth organic surfaces like power armor, I would really encourage you to take a two coats approach. Now the first coat of contrast you put on Often it'll go down like kind of all right, but maybe slightly patchy. And on the second coat, things will look much smoother. Paints like going down over themselves. Contrast is also um, it's very, very matte. So if you don't want your stuff to look ultra matte, which a lot of GW paints don't, GW is a satin range. If you want it to look slightly more shiny and deep, like I did, you can mix a shade in. And I find that really, really useful. So we'll show my guy kind of before and after. You can do two coats, you can mix a shade in with anything, but if you're only gonna be making 50% of a mistake because you're using your contrast slightly thinner, when you're doing the two coats, if you do make an error or there is a blob that you forgot or something like that, it's not gonna be as noticeable on your final job. So don't expect one thick coat to do the work for you. It's just kind of asking for trouble. And considering how much faster a second coat is than a first coat, because you're just doing a quick once over, if we look at before and after on screen here, it really does add quite a lot to the vibrancy of a model. So uh, yeah, it's worth taking your time a little bit more doing the two coats and especially on like an armor or something like that, you'll really, really see the benefits. The lighter an armor is, the easier it is to make a mistake. So imperial fists are gonna be quite difficult and stuff like that. A couple of thinner coats will make that way, way, way easier. Final do, do think about color. I know that sounds really, really obvious, but there's a couple of things that I like to bear in mind with my minis, especially when I'm slap chopping. One of them is that generally I don't want more than one main, very bright, vibrant color. It's really tempting to go and grab like the brightest thing you can with contrast. But if you've got like a pretty saturated red, like we have, then I don't want a large amount of like a very, very bright green or something like that. It's gonna kind of overpower it. And in fact, I'd actually like to save that for maybe like glowing eyes or lights or, you know, some other details like that. Another way to think about color is, especially if you're putting down a couple of coats that we are, or you've got the ability to slap a wash on afterwards or something like that, there are certain colors that are gonna have very strong associations. So a really good example is the bottle on the flamer on our guy. We painted that just with a Yandan, which is the default way that I do gold. And then I was looking at it, it just it didn't look quite right. So I went and looked at some gold references. And what I did is I just quickly mixed a little bit of our red that we used in with some contrast medium. And I put it in a couple of places on that as a second coat. So the moment you've done that, um, it deepened it and it made it look a lot more like gold just for a quick wash application. But you could also put like the sepia down over it, the wash or something like that. So be willing to go and look at a picture, a reference photo. What makes that gold look like gold? This is particularly helpful on metallics. Or what makes, you know, steely armor look like steely armor. And you might find it's way, way, way easier to put one coat down and then put a little bit of the right color somewhere. Maybe, I don't know, you want to dry brush a little bit of bone on something because it's gonna make it look the right color or something like that. At the end of your contrast, have a consideration for the colors that you're using where and when. You probably manage to achieve more in less time with less effort just for a little bit of thought. Okay, we're nearly there. A final one. Now this one has been touched on in basically every single tip that we've listed so far. Do not rush. I say this a lot of the time with dry brushing in general, but it's no different with contrast use. So your mini is gonna look pretty good regardless of what you do. You can make it look very good though if you don't rush and also you're gonna be a lot less likely to make mistakes. Now mistakes are frustrating and they're annoying and you have to go back and fix them. 
So a lot of the time, trying to go 10% faster could result in a mistake that means that you took 20% longer to do something. It's a completely false economy anyway. Concentrate on what you're doing. You don't have to go mega slow at all. I'm not suggesting that for a second, but take your time, treat things in sections. I think that's really helpful with contrast because then you won't miss areas. And you can use a reference photo if you want. Take a picture of your mini when it's prime black at the beginning and just have a look at how the light's reflecting on it. It'll make a really, really big difference. Now, there's something that I haven't put in a tip here because I think it was going to make the color selection one a little bit too long, but you don't have to use just black, just gray, and just white when you're slap chopping stuff. So for example, on this one, I started it off with a purple because I knew that I was going to use purple in the final step anyway, and purple works well with, it works well with the red. Is like a deep version of it. Just take a color that is close to black. You can mix black in with another color or whatever. And the way that I like to think about it is basically like, do I want a cool one or do I want a warm one? So you could use yellow uh, or brown on an area that was going to be gold. That's going to be fine either for the gray step. You could use a yellow there or the base coat. You could use a brown if you wanted. And this is a really good way to affect things kind of to your benefit. It's just the same as normal painting. You don't have to overthink it. It's not more complicated than you think and you're gonna hide quite a lot of it anyway. Um, if you don't have black, you don't get those really harsh lines, and sometimes that's really beneficial, particularly on areas like our Bloodthirster's wing in the past, and the gun on this. If we'd gone from black, it would have been quite hard to get exactly what we wanted because the shadows would have just been a non-color. Contrast, as strong as it is, it can't do anything over black if you're using it thinned, which we are, so make sure that you consider the colors you're using carefully and be willing to use bones or stuff like that. And you can always, let's say you're doing two steps of contrast, do your normal dry brushing, put down one step of contrast. You can then do a quick dry brush to pick out those edges again before you put your other contrast down, and that'll keep those edges looking brighter. So be willing to change up the order in which you do things. You don't need to be worrying about it too much. If you think about it carefully while you're doing it, it probably won't go wrong. If it does go wrong, it's quite easy to fix. Okay, hopefully we've covered everything there. I'm really, really pleased with the result we had on this Marine. Any steps are gonna add time, but it's up to you which ones you wanna pick or not, and which ones you wanna apply in which way, or maybe you can adapt them or something like that. If we've skipped over anything, or you've got any questions, or you've got a suggestion for a follow-up video, we're gonna give away three Series D Plus sets to the best three suggestions. It's just been Christmas, why not? Below in this video, so go down to the comments, let us know what we missed, let us know your best suggestion for a follow-up, or anything that we've maybe not done in enough detail, let us know and that will make its way into the next video on this subject, just like all of the fantastic suggestions did on our last job, slap chop video. I struggle with that one, it's difficult. We jumped on a couple of things like the purity seal and the gun, they got a little bit of TLC. I think that's worth it, but whether you wanna do that or not is up to you. Two really great references are obviously our original slap chop video popping up now, but also our 10 rules video, which has been very, very popular and is about how to spend whatever time you've got available the most efficiently to get the best result you possibly can. So both of those are linked on the screen now. That's it. Thank you very much for watching. Hope you had a fantastic Christmas. And here's to a new year of painting plenty more models. Let's slay the grey, as Ninja would say. Merry Christmas. Just gone. Happy New Year. Okay, so let's have a little talk about how I'm using my palette here at this stage. So, I have a purple guy. I've taken his head off because I'm probably going to do the head a different colour. Why have I got all these splodges going on in my palette? So the reason is, I wanted to use a colour that didn't cover very well. And because my palette is black, pretty much always from the beginning, I've always got the ability to test the coverage of my paint. So, Nagroth Knight was not doing it, so Basically, it's not a perfect equivalent, but I just added in a little bit of Xerus purple and a little bit of black. Black obviously being quite strong, and that's how we ended up with this color. We just want it a color that isn't black, which we've got. It could be a little bit more vibrant. I don't think it'll matter by the end of it, but I've always got this here to test. Same with picking our grays, going with London gray from below. This looks darker in the bottle than it is on the palette. Again, against black, you can see what it actually is, and I've got white paper there as well, so I've got a good comparison between the two. That's exactly the level of gray that we need to go for. Luckily, this is pretty much the most common kind of uh, value of gray that you'd be getting for spray cans and stuff like that as well. Slightly above the middle is a very, very popular place for quite a lot of grays. Okay, now brush choice. So some of these have already seen some use and I'm probably going to be using similar ones uh, that I have been already so far. So we're kind of, we're doing an infantry scale model. 
I want a general brush that is going to have a decent level of coverage. That's probably going to be a medium or a medium plus. And then I imagine that a small plus is going to be usable for the majority of the situations where I need something a bit smaller or I need to be able to get into a gap or something like that. So I'm going to grab a small plus and I think I'll go for a standard medium as well. Both of these are really good for kind of space means are pretty big these days. So I would regard them as like chunky infantry scale. These aren't small brushes in comparison to the model, you know, it's like the size of a shoulder pad, so it's still got a decent level of coverage and it'll hold a decent amount of paint. So I'll try and do everything I possibly can with a medium and I'll jump to the small plus or maybe grab a small if I need something a little bit more delicate. Nothing new here. We're going to be taking our paint carefully. We'll be putting it in lines. Even if I was using Citadel paints, I'll be putting it in lines here. A little bit of water there. Carefully take the paint. We're not putting it into the middle of the brush. And then we just start doing what we do best. Might have to glue his other foot. Yeah, I'm going to have to glue his other foot down. You don't want your model wobbling around. It's just not going to help. So yeah, he's getting glued. The joys of needle applicators. I'm fine with building this up slowly. I'm trying to do a fancy paint job here. And I'm going to be bearing in mind kind of, you know, what's the top, what's the bottom. I want the top to be the brightest. Just this. Patience. It won't take as long as you think. Just don't don't try and go specifically quick at any point. It's not about going mega slow. It's about not rushing. I'm absolutely going to be trying to hit the uh, gun and stuff in quite a careful way. So little circles, but pressing more from the top to the bottom. Because I want the bottoms to get dry brushed. These little sections. Just this all over. Patience, guys. Okay, so this is already looking pretty good. I would say and the reason for that is just because we've kind of worked with the model and with a zenithal stippling approach so we've started heavier at the top you know it's not perfect there's some bits here where we've gone side to side and you can tell that I've hit in the middle in a line for no good reason whoops but generally we've started from the top stippling and then we've done our all over dry rushing and buffing and normal stuff and you get these effects that we've not done it necessarily on purpose always but they're kind of shading out in the same places that you might see heavy metal kind of uh, dropping a shade in there or leaving that bit darker and then highlighting the bits that stick out and we're letting the model do the work for us, which is lazy and convenient. But what we can do now is following this as a guide, we're gonna bear that in mind with our white or our light step. So we're gonna really, really work the model to the best of our ability at this point. It won't even take that long because the white's quite strong. So we're gonna go carefully. We're gonna see what we can make of this model. Top tip, if you ever wanna work out if you've missed places, put on your camera and zoom in. So because it's a little bit more tricky to reach. I've not I've not gone into this area. White would definitely be reaching that. Not the end of the world if I miss it, and I might have to do something separate for this crest anyway. But um, yeah, I've missed a couple of bits. I'm gonna carefully go in with the gray. Maybe there's a thigh area that I should catch as well. We've still got the line that I said I should remove and try to remove. Evidently, I didn't do a very good job of that. I'm gonna try and stipple it out. So rather than going side to side on it and highlighting my mistake, I'm gonna try and hide it by just poking in there. So I'm gonna pick a smaller brush now. We could use an extra small plus. Let's do it. So just to show you the size differences that we're talking about here. There, so this one is going to be able to reach in between gaps that the others couldn't. It won't hold as much paint, and generally speaking, if I can use a larger brush for a dry brushing job, I do prefer to. But for here, basically, because we need to get in this gap. I think can get away with making a little bit more wet. I need to resist there to do normal left to right dry brushing. Do it up here. But there, I just want to be stippling in and kind of deleting. If I stipple e either side of that line, I should be able to semi-delete my problem. Final pass on the head, which I've got on a stick for access reasons. Have a little, any bit of fluff on it, that's a bad place. Okay, looking good. All right now, so moving on to the white, I am gonna get out the full selection of brushes just so I can have the option to pick whatever I need. I think probably the small will be used here. I can bring out the extra small plus if I need, but uh, I think the small is probably gonna be exactly the right size for fitting in some gaps. Essentially, if I'm trying to stipple in the middle of a section, 
if it's a bad example because it's round, it's a shoulder pad, I'm going to hit a smaller section of that anyway. But if I'm trying to hit the middle of a section or something specific, this is a better example in here, and I don't want to hit either side with the stippling rather than the dry brushing, I might want to be using a smaller brush, so we'll make that decision as we go. We're also not going to be using a white. I'm going to try using Luganath because I don't think we need to go all the way to white yet, and it might leave us some room. Of course, it's completely up to you how you want to do any of this. Keep it soft. There is no reason to rush any of this. Start with somewhere where I know we should be pretty safe. Somewhere highly textured, he says. There you go, you see that? It's doing a pretty tidy job, actually. I could be using different ones all over. Let's, uh, let's have a play. That might be cool for the metals. So we can revert what we've done on the gun. See here, it's exactly the example where I said that I could go to a smaller brush if I wanted, and it would help out to be using the uh, smaller brush at this stage. I don't know what we're going to do about his... I forgot the name of his chest thing. Because we want to go like strong colours around it, and it wants to be like white or gold or something. Maybe we paint the mini and then... Then we make the call about what we do depending on what happened with the contrast step. I'm going to show you how brave you can be with it. Stuff that you know is going to be bright on top, for example. I can bring this right up. It's definitely nearly small brush time. We tiered. Techie. Now having got off from above, I'm going to kind of get it roughly all over. Right, let's go to the lug enough now. Okay, so here's where we are. You really can be quite bold with the first stippling, and I'm gonna kind of show you that. So I've got a great big blob in the middle of this shoulder pad, which is where it's lightest from the gray step that we did. I'll show you how I'm gonna work out just kind of buffing that out. Now, one thing I will say is if you wanna stipple a smaller area, using a small brush is a great idea. But if you're trying to hit stuff generally, I would always use the largest brush you possibly can for the job. The reason for that is when the brush is set up well with the right amount of paint and the right dilution and stuff like that, which is obviously important, you'll have the brush in that condition for longer. And that's got a really high value because every time you go and you get a new mix, there's a chance that you get the mix you know, slightly wrong. And that's what we're trying to avoid. We don't want to put too much down and make a great big smear when we're trying to do fancy slap chops. So for that reason, I'm gonna stop being bad and using my painting brush to put paint on my palette and I'll use my very old tired scooping brush Still going that brush somehow. Okay, take a little. I'm not trying to work it into the brush, I'm trying to work it around the head of the brush. Test it on the palette, test it here. Go to the mini. And then where we've got that kind of heavy blob, I'm just gonna gently step on it. If you want your paint to leave more easily, you can make it wetter, which is only safe to do once you've checked out that everything's okay, it's not too strong, blah, blah, blah. And then you just carefully dab on the area. You can see that we're making a bigger circle, but it's softer at the edges. Again, make it wetter, remove some paint. Now that's a slow and steady way, the rough and ready way, which is nearly as good and way faster, is just to dry brush around that area. Oh, too wet. I don't like my stippling dry. We can buff it out. See if we can do it on this section here that's got really bold stippling. I'm now going to add white into the mix. You'll see this is as light as you get. I'm not going to use pure white. This is as bright as we can possibly get on our mini. So. Same again, start off stippling in an area carefully and then when the brush has got less pink leaving it, 
it's dried out a little, then we'll go to normal dry brushing. We'll just do that until we're happy. Okay, so I want to show you the kind of traditional dry brushing step that I'm doing because I think a lot of people would probably assume that I'm being more gentle than I am right now and I think it's quite important to show it doesn't matter. Tiny amount of paint on the brush, got our peachy off white, set it up and we're just going to test a lot on the palette. You can, this is why you don't want a hyper textured one, you want a flattish surface, see if the edges are being picked out. They are, we're good, I'm very confident in the behaviour of this brush. So like the details of this backpack, a really good example. If in doubt, circles is fine. But I'm going to go side to side across these to try and hit those. A bit like edge highlighting, really. Very efficient edge highlighting. That's it. So I'm not, I'm not like pushing it into the model, but I'm not being gentle. And it's all about setting up the brush carefully. You really don't need to be too worried. No nasty surprises. So it's about the setup. It's not about, you know, like manual dexterity or brush control or necessarily even experience. It's just about doing your experiment on the palette and not ignoring the information that you've got available because it's really useful information. It's going quite fast at this stage, really. I've not got too much left to do. I'm being quite rough, so I really don't want my mini wiggling around. If it wiggles around, you'll highlight two edges instead of one edge. So. Make sure to hold it secure. Now with a pure white on here, I can go to the gun without it being a problem. We can hit that chest insignia gently. If you can't reach somewhere, get it in and twist against it. Super sneaky. Right, it's looking pretty cool. It's looking very stylized. One final pass carefully for the edges, especially, and I think we're done. Just want to catch specific edges, specific details. Pretty cool already. Time to make our mix. I'm going to start with Flesh Terror's Red. I really like it as a color. Mine's a bit old, um, so it's probably dehydrated, which is why I've put some contrast medium in already. Such a good color. I, I might just go with it and dilute it a bit. I could use like a um, sepia or something, but more for the contamination police out there. So what I want to do is I want to lay down a first stage that is a little bit softer and more delicate, and then we can always go further in our second stage. A tiny bit of a wash in there. Eat dark, bloody, and soft. Always have my medium ready in case anything goes wrong. And quickly, I'm just going to dust the mini. Clean brush. You can blast it with an airbrush as well while I do this. Absolutely fine. And then we start somewhere it doesn't matter so much at the back. That is probably too soft. That's okay, we can make it stronger. Definitely feels like my flesh terrors is physically thicker than it should be. It's quite an old contrast. They do definitely change personalities. Too strong. All yeah, right. All right, so I wanted to get a shot of the partially completed one. Um, I've been using an M3. I'd use an like, uh, this is a, a shorter style of brush here. So I'd be using like a one or a two in a normal brush or a two and a three in uh, a stubby. This is a miniature brush. And the reason for that is you want to hold enough paint, but not too much. But you also do want to tip, especially if you're trying to go around areas like this. It can be a bit tricky. If you're going all over, then obviously don't worry about it. You know, use something old and flat ended if you want. And a beefy one, there's no problem with that. It's looking pretty good. You can see the difference between the two. Us, we've got some patchiness. The second coat should go down better, they tend to. We'll make sure it's kind of nice and thin. And what we'll do is, the moment you put a second coat down, the chance that another blob appears here is there, but we can be quite careful and try and spread things around a bit. And the second coat should make things look a lot smoother. It's looking pretty good anyway. Okay, so let's take a view of this process. Like I said, I do think my, um, I can put a tiny bit of water in. I do think my contrast has kind of thickened up a little over time. Okay, so it's difficult to show on camera because it's kind of top down, but one thing that I'm quite careful about when contrasting is that I try to keep my orientation the same because I don't want my contrast running in two directions. So I'll start at the top with the shoulder pad. With what looks like quite a lot, we have a fluff. Get out of there. Okay. And then working not too slow. 
I'll take all of that contrast all the way down over the edges. I tend to work in sections. Then I'll move my head and my brush angle around to try and get as much as I possibly can um, in terms of like coverage and hitting all the areas without tipping my model around because already this will be starting to evaporate and dry onto the mini and I don't want it running in two different directions. Anywhere we've got excess pooling, nip in there, press my brush in, and then if while doing that, while mopping up, kind of delete anything can go back in there. Check at the bottom, mop. It's gonna be under the corner of the shoulder pad. This is where you get problems here, specifically there and a couple of other places. You won't be noticing, you'll be looking at the top of it, and then suddenly you've got this great big kind of corner like well of paint that takes ages to dry. It might even finish, you know, looking a bit more shiny or a different color or something like that. So it's worth being aware of this stuff. Carefully turning it around, making sure I haven't missed anywhere and getting my head literally underneath the model where light is a bit worse, it's a bit tricky, just to try and make sure that I've caught everything. You can always just paint things like black or, you know, Whatever. I've got some red there, it's a bit of a problem, but we'll work it out. I'm gonna let that dry, and then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, oh dear, <laughs> fixed. I'm gonna thin my current mix, maybe make a new one. I'm gonna go all over and kind of soften things. Should look really punchy by the end of it. Let it dry 100% and don't kind of pick it up and fiddle with the angle, especially when it's nearly dried. Obviously you don't have to make your own mixes, but uh, all the principles that I'm talking about here will apply whether you're making your own mixes or not. What I'm gonna do for my second step is just take exactly the mix we have been doing. I'm gonna use this a lot thinner because we've got kind of a decent amount of pooling going on already for basic color. Now I wanna drop something a little bit punchy in. I've changed to a different brush. This is a size two, but it'll hold more than the three because it's longer. And basically, we're just going to do exactly what we did before again. The aim is not for this to be thick. Now, if you hadn't dry brushed, this wouldn't be doing much. But because we've already got brighter and darker sections from our dry brushing, this is just coloring those really, really nicely. As you can see, I'm getting a lot out of the one brush. It's quite a strong color that I've made. Whoops. But also it's going over a red, so it's got an easy time making it look red. There we go. These always look great if you get them right. Save shoulder pads to last because they're scary. Super easy. You're really rewarded for this step for just kind of trusting that when you go down for a second time, it's going to make a big difference. You should find this, uh, because you're putting it on pretty thin, you should find that these dry pretty quick. So you kind of need to be careful. Make sure you go over your sections quite fast. You could probably go thicker if you wanted. It just depends how deep you want the color. Again, just be careful. Excess pooling. Some pooling is fine. It's how contrast works, but excess pooling is absolutely the enemy of getting the most out of contrast. You don't want flooding. Look at the important section on the arm here. Work quick, make sure I get it in all the gaps and try to not paint the gun. Looking good. Get the shoulder pad so much better the second time around. End your strokes where you want to deposit the most and then if there's excess, just mop it up. It's looking so good. I said about the problem places, look, that is what happens. Whoops. This is behind and the back, so I missed it. Yeah, kind of mucked that up. That's what you want to avoid. If you do make mistakes on edges, you can uh, pretty much 100% mitigate them with a little bit of careful re-dry brushing. Nothing wrong with that. With the red completed, one final magic step. I want it to be more shiny. So I'm gonna dilute some Trucci Violet heavily with water. I'm gonna hit the entire mini. So deepen it in two ways. 
and I'm going to hit even the areas that we haven't got red as well. Reasons will be apparent in the next step. I mean, it won't stay that shiny because it's wet, obviously, but um, you can see the depth we're getting from that. This is absolutely cheaty, which is why we love it. Now, one thing that I think people just aren't willing to do enough is experiment on parts of their models that don't matter as much. So, in speaking about the back of the gun that I practically forgot, I've got a uh, nightshade. Yeah, I've got Drakenhof nightshade. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to attempt to do a little bit of kind of sneaky shading. It is a shade, after all, towards the bottom of this section to make it look more like it's uh, shiny metal. So all this will do is, in comparison, it'll make the top look shinier. And all we've got to do is dab it in the middle of the sections we've done. This is very popular on our Necron Lord from a while back because it allows you to use a shade to make it look like you've edge highlighted because it fills in the gaps between your edges so nicely. So hopefully, I'll show it up nicely on camera, that should add a little bit more depth to it. You could do that with any color, um, it'd be absolutely fine. As far as the brown parts go, I've just kind of scooted around. I mixed, um, I'm not really a huge fan of Black Legion, but if you want something done only once, it is very strong. So I've used it on the, um, the parts in the backs of the legs and stuff like that. And then I've diluted it with Gulliman Flesh, which is a lot softer for things like his gun holster, which I'll probably do a second count on. Um, but yeah, it's looking okay. Stuff like this is really valuable um, because we're kind of sticking with contrast only, well, slap shop only. It gives us an option for kind of cheating our way and getting some fancy techniques. Add a bit of the purple in as well. I need to decide which bits of this are what colors, and I have to do some of it looking gold, which I do think is quite hard with Slapshot, but we do have our secret checkers in the back pocket, which is basically to just use the right colors to make it look like it's goldy. Now, I actually want to get this in as many coats as possible rather than as few. If we're doing something like leather, I really think that you can do lots of thin steps. So I'm going to be careful with pulling. It adds the depth of it. And you know, it's a, it's a small piece, it won't take long. That was actually too thick. Hopefully we've still got room for maybe one or two more steps. It should look nice and old. Scary steps begin. Now I want to put something a little bit dark underneath our yellow. Purple will do, brown uh, will do and also green will do. So I'm going to put green under this bit, I think. I'm just going to commit to it as well. This bit will be gold. Okay, we've got our Yandan. I'm going to do a couple of coats, probably thin slightly with Gilliman Flesh. I think maybe I should have gone red in the recesses, but it's going to look okay. Right, these silver sections, or at least one of them, for Drakenhof, which is, uh, it's got black in it, Drakenhof. So it's a kind of blue-black, which I think is quite nice for steel. And again, absolutely fine with doing multiple steps of this. I'm actually going to put some blue over the Black Templar section. It should still end up looking different enough from the others, but Black Legion, sorry, it was a little bit warmer and browner than I wanted it, so. There you go, that's looking better. I want it to look like it's all shiny metal, but it's just different types of shiny metal. So colors are important if we're trying to go for gold. Put out a couple of colors here and look which one looks more like. I'd like gold highlights to be light earth and buff from AK. Uh, it's not gonna be light earth, is it? These are a bit more than that, gotta be careful. Yeah. Okay, that's enough. Got to be careful here because we're going to build up too much uh, unwanted texture. Time for heat bloom on this bit of the barrel. So I'm going to go from sepia to violet and then I need to pick a, um, a blue. I'm just going to be careful to keep it thin. Sepia is uh, super soft and delicate these days anyway. so shouldn't be too hard to keep this thin at least. 
Okay, so I've done the first step. I realized I made a mistake. I should have just done this section here, but I want to be the sepia section and left the section after it out. The reason is I don't want the brown to necessarily be strongly affecting the purple. I think we should be fine, but um, yeah, that's why it's darker here and lighter here. I popped some sepia over the gold. I think it's kind of deepened it. I do need to do something to kind of push that further into a range that I'm happy with. Right, Petrucci. Always got the back to experiment on as ever. The other option I have is to give it a quick white dry brush um, to make this kind of punch out more. Hold that in mind. I'd rather not because of risk of adding texture, but we'll see. Do you think it might be a good idea? Do a couple more steps and we'll see. So I think I'm going to dilute it less with water, but I'm going to use it thinner. I'll do several quick stages of it. So let's see if we can make that work in practice. Starting to show promise, I think. I want it on the top as well, but I do want the top to be lighter. So I think if it's gonna, if I'm gonna fail anywhere, it's gonna be on the top of the barrel. Positive mental attitude. We're not planning on failing, but if it does happen, I think that's probably where it will. Because it was taking a little bit too many steps, or we were gonna have to take too many steps to make a big difference. What I've done is I've just mixed a little bit of magenta. Yeah, I think that's maybe done it, or maybe we've just built up enough wet blending on the back might be way easier often it's just a wet brush and then you kind of push backwards and forwards at the edge of the section in question and time for the blue i have never used this paint before what could possibly go wrong soften it a bit yeah maybe i don't need that black uh, let's see how it looks yeah too black maybe just go for it pure so that's a pure blue what we got going on. Yeah, maybe I should have just been using the funky con Yeah, I should. I should have been using the funky contrast from the beginning. We'll, uh, we'll do this section, then we'll have a think about what we can do to uh, make up for that slip. I think Trevarian used some of these in a video or did something like this. Let's go and copy a better painter than us. It, like, it's got the right kind of vibe going on, obviously when it's black on the end or something, it'll, it'll help sell it better. Why, like, the black was less effort, I concentrated less, and I just yellowed it and I wet blended, and the back looks better than the front. Maybe it was that shading it to dark at the bottom has kind of removed our ability for colors to look bright. It should look pretty bright. What are you gonna do? So, one of the slap shot rules, like, if something isn't working, and you can do something with a quick bit of highlighting. It's always worth reconsidering. You don't have to go 100%. Like you're not going to paint your eyes with slap drop necessarily, are you? What I'm going to do is I'm going to put some little lines under here, some little highlights on the edges with white. And what that is going to allow is when we redo the inks, which we're going to do quickly, over those sections, there'll be bright colors. That should stand out and look cool. Let's give it a bash. Could probably use this. Maybe I should grab a double zero, but I'm kind of used to this size two now. Maybe I could have just dry brushed it. And maybe I could have used a double zero. I, I had these lines here originally. Could have just left them in and used lighter, brighter colors. I am going to dry brush it as well. Luckily, because the dry brushing has been fairly careful and because we put some shades down, it's, it's not too thick there. So I don't think we'll like overly delete stuff. So what we're going to do, I'll try dry brushing it on the back. I've got the opportunity to experiment and learn. I think light would be reflecting along there, so it's the same line that we've got on the rest of it. Okay. So we're here. Let's get a few more in. We're going to need to do something up here after all. And this one. And that's also an excuse for more like that. Okay. Let's see how we go. Keep it thin. Make sure I go up to and over the edges when I catch my work there. Definitely standing out more over the white that we redid. I think I just should have kept it brighter overall. 
Oh, I've got this color, I'm just gonna run it into the recesses. Okay, I don't think I can add any more now. I think I'll just make it too dark, so last step. Sepia, which is pretty soft. So it should be the most forgiving part, really. That looks better. It's not necessarily about being perfect. It's just, you know, this is something you will have seen in real life. And if you do the right colors in the right order, kind of all right, it's probably enough to sell it. Back literally is better. <sighs> and I think we need to go to black at the end, which should be super easy. Take blue, black, drag and huff. While I wait for it to dry, I'm just going to hit the rest of the uh, rest of the gun. Come on, I reckon that works. Right, there's some things that you just can't get with a dry brush, so I'm going to fix a couple little mistakes that I've got elsewhere on the model now. Painting around the chest insignia was always going to be a really difficult bit, so hit the top of that skull. Essentially dry brushing sideways here. So we're only going in one direction. And hopefully we don't press anywhere apart from the raised areas. I let the model paint itself. Okay, 